Now I'd like to ask everybody to uh, join me in welcoming Andreas Eriksson, our next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be talking about Nagios Core 4, what's new in there, and the various improvements that have been done that uh, will affect you as the user groups. Um, I'm 32 years old for another month, which is good. Uh, I've been programming since I was around seven, and I work as a core architect at OP5. A core architect is somewhere between a system designer and software developer and presentation monkey or something. Um, I am uh, one of the co-maintainers of Nagios Core since uh, about 2009, and I will be found at the bar in the evening. So if you have any questions you don't want to ask now or anything, just look me up there. Right. <coughs> um, about OP5. Actually, this presentation is pretty cramped on time already. So I'm just going to say that OP5 has a lot of info at the we have a lot of info at our web page. We specialize in doing um, very high performance Nagios installations with our product, which we call OP5 Monitor. Read all about it. <coughs> right, Nagios Core 4 then. Sorry if I'm coughing a bit, by the way, I'm recovering from a slight cold. Um, I'm gonna discuss, discuss the goals we had when we set out to, uh, to make Nagios 4. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of uh, computer science crash course here. Um, we're going to go through the new features and future possibilities. Actually, I think I cut out the future possibilities, but they're still on here, so we can discuss them briefly if you want to. Um, a few of the goals that we had was that we want to make Nagios, want to keep Nagios stable. It is stable now, it's working very well. Uh, we want to increase the scalability so that we can increase the performance, basically, of all parts of Nagios that, so that they work as fast and as good as possible. Uh, we want to keep the simplicity. Uh, one of the very, very key features of Nagios that has made it so successful is that it, anyone can write a plugin. If you can write any type of scripting language or can write a one-liner in shell, then you can actually write a plugin. That is a very, very simple API that we use against plugins. And um, simplicity and usability go hand in hand. Without users, Nagios would die very quickly. Um, <coughs> so we have to maintain a low complexity. Uh, we have to do testing. Uh, we have to use sufficient, sufficient code, uh, of course, and avoid m magic as much as possible. <coughs> now we come to the computer science crash course. When we're doing algorithm analysis, we, do, we have a, a sort of big O notation, which we, we call it big O. Uh, if we want to do something on 100 elements, there are different categories that the algorithm that we use will fall into. If we have a constant time algorithm, it will take, if one operation takes one microsecond, this is actually a lie, that's a nanosecond, I think. Anyways, it's very, very quickly, very, very fast, and then it increasingly gets worse. When we get to factorial uh, performance, then we have somewhere around 144 billion years, which is pretty bad. <coughs> this gets a lot clearer if we compare them to each other and how much, how fast they grow. This is only for 10 elements. I know a lot of people in here have hosts, have like 5,000 hosts. I know uh, one guy who sits around 40,000 hosts in one of his configurations. If you try to use a shitty algorithm or an algorithm that doesn't really take into account the, the most efficient way of doing something, you're going to end up with this peak being 10,000 trillion times taller than the small one here. Um, we're going to see some effects of that, and there are effects of that uh, in Nagios 4, actually, um, which Daniel has helped me verify. So uh, logarithmic, screw that, actually. It's just, just know that there are different classes of, of uh, different types of way of doing things. So, and some are really, really fast. Some are really, really slow. And they only really matter when you get to really large data sets. If you have really small ones, nothing matters. You can write any kind of shit. Um, I.O. media comparison. When we have hard disk drives, uh, this is for a SCSI uh, top of the line uh, RAID 5 cluster thing, I think. Um, have a, has a seek time of about 5.11 milliseconds. Uh, solid state drives have 0 0.24 milliseconds. And in RAM, we get down to 13 nanoseconds, which is 0 0.0000. Um, not really important. I try to make a graph of this. 
But it turns out that RAM will never ever show up because it's 400,000 times faster than hard drives. So <coughs> the conclusion we can draw here is that all types of disk access is really, really bad. When we need to go down to the disk to do anything, we lose instantly because it's 400,000 times slower than doing it in memory. Um, the test setup that I used to do my bottleneck analysis had 3,000 hosts, 200,000 services, a uh, five minute check interval, and a really, really stupid plugin, which is called check A OK. It says, everything's OK. And then it exits and says that everything's OK. <coughs> the bottlenecks that we found um, were these ones, basically. Configuration parsing was a huge hurdle at first. It wouldn't even load my configuration. So I set out to, set out to fix that. Uh, event queue insertion. This was actually, I didn't think this would, be, uh, this would be a bottleneck, but profiling of the code showed me that it was. So for large configurations, Nagios spends 99% of its time adding events. That's in Nagios, Nagios 3. Um, if we go back to the algorithm analysis, it runs in ON time, which means it looks at every event in the queue on average, actually worst case, but it turns out that the worst case is the one we hit almost all the time. So, and it does that 667, six, 676 times per second with our test configuration. But we, um, well, I know that the lowest bound for that is a logarithmic algorithm that only looks at a small, small portion of it. <coughs> the macro resolution, uh, we, when we're doing we're resolving macros to, uh, to run checks like host address and whatever, uh, user stuff. We also do a linear search on the macro table. It has 150 something entries. And we do that for every macro that we have to resolve. Um, it turns out that we're calling strcomp, which is the function that compares two strings to each other, uh, 3,700 times per second with Nagios 3. Uh, the final one, job spawning and check reaping. It's very, very heavy on something called cache line fills, which means that uh, the computer is trying to look something up in the really, really fast memory, notices that it isn't there, and then it fetches it from somewhere else that is a lot slower into the very, very fast memory, and then it looks it up again. <coughs> that takes time. Uh, also very heavy on disk I.O., and as I showed you before, disk I.O. kills us immediately. Um, it also lacked a bit from insufficient parallelization because only one check could be spawned at one time. Now I'm only discussing the, the in Nagios' own internal check engine, uh, which is used when you run active checks of anything. It, some sort of check engine is, is used for every check that is spawned, no matter how that, is, how that happens. So having a, having a good check engine is really important. <coughs> um, if we look at, the, at how Nagios 3 executes checks, we see that it will, read the, it will read the scheduling queue. It will fork a child. The child writes half the check result file. The child forks again and runs shell. The shell parses the command line. The shell forks and then it runs the plugin. The child reads the status and output, completes the check result file, creates an OK to read file, then it exits. And Nagios picks up that file from a spool directory, finds the check result file. Is it OK to read? If it is, we read the file. If it's not, we get a cache miss, and we go back to reading the scheduling queue. Um, otherwise, we parse the check results, remove the results, and remove the OK to read file. <coughs> if we're looking at the, the hotspots here, the things that take a lot of time, we'll find that it looks roughly like this. The red ones show disk access. This is dark red because it's a, it's a very bad disk access. It's the worst kind, where we're looking for a file that doesn't exist. It means the kernel has to reread the directory entry from disk to see that this file actually really doesn't exist. <coughs> the yellow ones are when we use very heavy uh, system calls, where we have to fork, we create a copy of our own process, which involves copying a lot of memory. Uh, and then we start up with a new table, which involves context switches and things that aren't really important. They cost a lot of time, though, so we would like to get rid of them. <coughs> oh, this is supposed to have something with solutions first. There we go. Config parsing solution. Um, we do a, nowadays in Nagios 4, we do a depth first search for host and service dependencies. That means we turn a quadratic algorithm into a linear one, which 
means that for our 20,000, the 20,000 service dependencies I was using, uses 20,000 operations instead of 400 million operations. The numbers quickly get ridiculous when you compare two algorithms to each other with any sort of actually uh, useful data sets. But this is what happens. <coughs> Group members are no longer duplicated. Uh, they used to be copied with huge strings, and then the strings would be resolved themselves. Now we instead resolve them once and add them to a list, which we can concatenate a lot faster than having to compare the strings. Uh, we also do object verification only once. Um, the code was a bit organic, so I think that as stuff was added, uh, we verified it in a separate step later. But for a lot of the cases, we knew that what we were verifying had already been verified earlier. So just, rem just cutting away a lot of code that did something exactly the same as something else did. And the effect here is that <coughs> Nagios loads configurations really, really, really fast. Um, a sample configuration that, I, that was sent, for me, sent to me from a guy from Pepsi uh, took one and a half minutes to load with Nagios 3 and 0 0.3 seconds with Nagios 4. I know that uh, Dan, who's sitting here in the second line, third line, uh, has some, uh, he helped me a lot to get this uh, up and running. And um, we, did some, we did some quick math and found out that his large system configuration, I think, would take four, no, the small system configuration would take 4,000 years to complete. Um, and with Nagios 4, that one ran in 0 0.2 seconds. So the numbers quickly get ridiculous when you compare algorithms that have large numbers put into them, mathematical functions. But huge improvements anyway. <coughs> For the event queue, uh, we moved to a priority queue based on a binary heap. If you want to Google that, do that. You will find the one, uh, you will most likely find something called libpq, which is written by a guy named Volkan uh, for and is used in the Apache web browser web server. Um, it means that we turn insertion from O n to O log n. That's we move down one step for insertion operations. And for extracting one event, we move from O from constant time to, to move up one step. But still much more efficient. So instead of doing 43 million operations per second, we now do 9,460. That's a huge improvement. Uh, this improvement alone, I think this is actually in Nagios 3.4.1. I'm not 100% certain, but I think it is. This change alone made Nagios stop hogging 99% of one CPU entirely uh, while it's running. So the main Nagios process uses a lot less CPU <coughs> uh, thanks to this patch. Um, special kudos here to the libpq author Volkan Yasichi. <coughs> uh, macros. We sort the macros once on, on when we start Nagios, and when we do lookups later, instead of having a linear search, we do a binary search, which is a, which is a logarithmic op operation because we divide the result that we're looking through by half every time we look. So we move it down from 65,360 to uh, 3,010 operations per second. We could actually improve on that further, but it doesn't seem to be a bottleneck anymore, so I'm not going to bother. Um, the worker processes have a, have a perfect hash algorithm when they're parsing their check results, but that runs a lot more often than this one does, so not going to bother. Um, the effect, anyways, is that Nagios, main Nagios process uses less CPU. Uh, we could get rid of even more of it by very, very simply by each just caching the check commands that we're supposed to run, the raw command line. Uh, that's really, really trivial now because each object has a separate ID so we can look them up in constant time and get rid of that completely. <coughs> check solutions. Worker processes. Uh, worker processes run all helper apps. They run checks, notifications, event handlers, everything that Nagios spawns that turns into a separate command. Uh, we increase the number of the max number of forks per second that we can do. Um, I actually tested this, and on Linux, it's supposed to be a copy and write. So if you don't modify the memory that gets copied, it doesn't get copied at all. It doesn't appear to work that way, or we're doing something weird. Because uh, for a 300 megabyte process, which is what my 3,000 hosts and 200,000 services was, 
we can fork 800 times per second. That's, that's the real limit on my system, at least. I would imagine it would go up a bit with faster memory and stuff, but not that much. <coughs> if the process is only one megabyte, we can fork almost 14,000 times, which means that we can do that many checks. <coughs> we also stop writing all the we also stop writing all the check results to to disk and just fork them directly into Nagios using uh, using memory pipes. So uh, the effect here is that we reduce the I/O load by a lot. It's a huge factor, and the only I/O generated by Nagios now uh, in my test setup is actually from writing the log file, and it still has to keep doing that. So it went from about 100% to about one, which is good. Uh, we also reduce the CPU usage a lot because checking for doing all these context switches for when the kernel has to look on the file system and see is this file actually there uh, it takes a lot of CPU time. So uh, we reduce that a lot as well. <coughs> and now we can run about 300,000 checks every five minutes uh, actively scheduled. That is up from about 30,000 in Nagios Core 3. So it's uh, quite an improvement. I have to say these numbers are a bit some four finger bits, like because uh, the way that they are measured isn't can't it can't be done the same as it was in Nagios Core 3. So what I did was I just added checks to it, just more and more checks until I started seeing that the checks uh, timed out basically, which means that the workers can't fork any more processes. And it worked fine at 300,000. It didn't work at 700,000. So I said, well, 300,000 is still very very good. Um, kudos here to Sven Nierlein, William Leibson, and Sean Gabez, which were, uh, have done sort of like proof of concept implementations. If you're familiar with uh, DNX, Mod German, or Schinken, um, <coughs> they use this, this check model already, but they do it less efficiently than Nagios Core can do because we can take a lot of shortcuts that, uh, that other programs can't. Schinken is a, well, it's Python, so it won't go as fast as Nagios. Um, the breakdown of it is like this. Workers are spawned by Nagios. Uh, they're chosen in a round-robin fashion, really, really stupidly. We could add some better logic to that so that the one with the least amount of work to do gets chosen. Uh, doesn't seem to be a problem yet, so I haven't even bothered looking into it. Uh, the, the workers communicate with Nagios using something called libnagios which is a bunch of helper APIs that are very, very useful for writing, uh, well, actually for writing Nagios core and for writing uh, workers and add-ons and stuff. Um, <coughs> one thing that we still can do is add special purpose workers. So if you're monitoring a switch network or just infrastructure, you add one daemon, have it connect to Nagios and say, hey, I'll take care of all your checks that are supposed to go through to check uh, for interface errors. Just give them to me. And then it handles them magically. It does whatever it wants. Um, so then we can get zero forks. There is an experimental implementation of that uh, that uh, my colleague Robin did uh, yes, day before yesterday. But it was not very good. Uh, well, it didn't look very pretty. And it broke a couple of other things. So I couldn't really add it. Uh, then, of course, there are remote workers. Uh, which, which would uh, obsolete DNX and Mod German completely. And it's really, really simple to do once you have the special purpose workers. The difficult part about special purpose workers is that they need to, need to have something that handles a request that says, hey, I can, I can work, I can do stuff. Um, that will be done by Tuesday next week, I think, something like that. It's not really super difficult, but I didn't write it like that from the start. And now I'm paying the price for my stupidity. <coughs> so if we look at the Nagios 4 uh, check flow chart in the hotspots here, we'll see that it, Nagios reads the scheduling queue, worker receives a command, the worker forks. We can't get away from that one fork. Uh, the worker parses the command line. And if it's simple, that means it doesn't have any I output redirection or uh, job control. Like, you know, you can pipe and fork output from one to another. We don't do that because that would be tricky and ridiculous. So then we fork, then we paw it off to shell instead and let that one handle it for us. Otherwise, we just run the plugin and we read status and output and the worker sends data back to Nagios. Nagios parses check results and hoopla da. 
Um, if we have special purpose, purpose workers, we can get away without the fork completely. We just have worker parses command line, and then it voodoo. Something happens here that is completely magical, and we don't even have to care about it, because all we have to do is understand the check results that we get back from the worker. And if that's flummoxed somehow, we can, we can tell the worker to, to take a hike. Uh, we can tell it that we're not going to take any more stuff for, from you. So if you write a special purpose worker, you better make sure that it writes its results back to Nagios in the proper format. Otherwise, things will not work so well. Um, with this model, we could probably do somewhere around 10 million checks from a single server, actually. <coughs> now if we compare it to the Nagios 3 flowchart, you will see that it's pretty obvious that, uh, that Nagios 4 will do a lot more work in the same time as Nagios 3 did. <coughs> Check engine performance comparison. This is good. I know marketing people always like this. So, um, Centrion, which is the French Nagios fork, they actually managed to reduce their check performance from Nagios 3. Very weird. Um, the Isinga guys, they claim that they have increased the performance. I didn't see any difference at all compared to Nagios 3, which they have just completely copied um, when they did their, their tests. But I included theirs their improved numbers just for comparison. This is Nagios 3, about 30,000 checks every five minutes. Um, Mod German and Schinken, that didn't use a disk before. Uh, they had a lot more checks that they could do. With Nagios 4, this is, uh, this is the low limit, the limit that I know works. The actual limit is somewhere between here and 700,000. So <coughs> that's good. Uh, a couple of new features in Nagios 4. Uh, the major ones are LibNagios, which actually isn't that major, but uh, since it's just a, a toolkit. Um, we have the query handler, and we have something called Nerd. Nerd is pretty awesome. Um, minor features, we have service parents. And for host and service objects, you can configure an hourly value, plus, and you can set a minimum value for contacts. Uh, there is also a new macro which I might actually have merged away right now. But anyways, check source. Uh, a lot of people are using, <coughs> are using uh, distributed setups one way or another, or they're using the module that distributes the checks for them. And when they get a check result or an alert for a check result, they have no idea where that check came from. So the check source thing will add that to your notifications and make sure that you can, you can get that information. <coughs> Libnagios is pretty boring unless you're, a, unless you're a programmer. IO Broker is a multiplexing library. Well, these are your components. These are actually Doxygen documented. Let's see if I can get that up here. So we can, you can look into the type make docs and just look up the things that are happening here. If you're a programmer, this makes perfect sense to you. If you're not, sorry. Nothing I can do about that. <coughs> There are tools here to write very small and very simple uh, add-ons that do very, very useful and very cool stuff very, very quickly. Here is one of them. This is an example that uses Libnagios. And I'm actually going to show you this program later in action when it does something real. Um, this is only about 30 lines of code. And it connects to our query handler and then runs a, uh, runs a few queries, subscribes to nerd channels. Query handler, time to introduce it. This is a general purpose handler for addressable queries in Nagios core. Um, <coughs> you que your query looks like this. Uh, you say at, and then an address, and then you put a space, and then you write your query, and you end it with a null byte. If you do that, type that into Nagios, you will get, it, the query will get addressed to the thing that has registered uh, for answering queries at that address. So event broker modules can say, oh, hey, I can answer queries uh, directed to, uh, for instance, Merlin or Mod German. And then, they, then you can get information from, directly from the module where they can answer, oh, hi, I have four workers online, and uh, one of them seems to be doing something weird or whatever. And if you have endo utils, you can, get, uh, you can get information directly from there if it registers for, a, uh, for, a, for answering queries. On the handler. You configure it like this. Query socket equals path to blah, 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 somewhere. It sets up a Unix domain socket, which 
uh, turns out to be almost a file on your file system. <coughs> Kudos for inspiration here to Matthias Kettner. I've been wanting to add something like this to Merlin for since forever. And uh, I talked about it uh, to uh, Sven Nierlein, the Mod German author, and he wanted something similar as well. Building it into Nagios was made a lot more sense, actually. Um, there is an echo service built in. It's the dumbest ever. It just sends you your output right back at you. Works nice, though. Nerd. Uh, the Nagios Event Radio Dispatcher. Uh, provides real-time data to outside add-ons. That's actually a pretty major new thing because it hasn't been possible to do that before without trying to follow a log file or doing some other weird thing. Uh, so this can reduce IO load of current add-ons or reduce the CPU usage or whatever. Uh, you, get, you query it as nerd via the query handler. So this registers for an address uh, with the query handler and says, I will respond to everything that has nerd in front of it. So an example query here is you can subscribe to the host check channel uh, each of these are called radio channels, sort of, because you can have a lot of people listening in. Um, or you can subscribe to the service checks. Uh, we're going <coughs> to, I'm going to add a few more things there, like macro support. So you can say, hey, I want to subscribe to host checks, and I want the data in this format. And then Agios will translate it to you, for you, into using the standard macro resolution stuff. So get a host check and you can say, I want to see the last state of it and I want to see the new state of it, for instance. Uh, also going to add an alerts channel, which is nifty, because then you can have, then you can write an external alert engine or whatever. Um, now it's demo time. This is good. Uh, using these pretty simple, simple items from Nagios, it's, it's easy to write cool and useful add-ons. This is very useful, isn't it? <coughs> this might look a bit stupid, and it certainly is. You can use this for anything in production, uh, except that if you know that this is a real-time data display of my laptop imitating running checks, it actually, it's actually a running check, it's running that stupid plugin, uh, and these workers are the ones that are responsible for handling them. And this is the network that we're monitoring. It's a pretty big network. But then this suddenly turns pretty interesting because that means that you can now see how many, you can see if there starts spamming yellow lines from these things down here. That means that we've failed scheduling checks, for instance, because then we've scheduled too many checks close together. <coughs> I think it's having a bit of trouble rendering and reading in real time at the same time. So, yeah. Um, but this is, this is all from the, from the, uh, from the nerd radio. So now we're reading data in, data in real time. I'm going to cut that one. Uh, and this is how it works. I'm not sure if you can see it on there. Let me do like S talk is just a stupid program I wrote to test this stuff. So if I say echo, hello. Uh, you will get the exact same output back. This is Nagios actually saying hello to you all for the first time. I've been playing with it for years. Now it finally talks. <laughs> uh, and the nerd request as well. Subscribe service checks. <coughs> and now you get the output here. The, the lines with hashes and arrows and stuff are just debug output from the program that I wrote saying this is how much we read in this batch, and this is from that one. But this is, this is really real-time data, although slightly messed up because I've only done the debugging version yet. So uh, when this gets macro support, you will be able to just subscribe to the channel and get, see your, your check commands rolling by. It's pretty awesome. Do, 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 do. I survived the demo. Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah. Um, other features and service parents. This is something me and Ethan actually discussed in Bolzano in 2010, 11? Well, a while back. Um, and well, I did a call for configs when I was doing uh, when I was doing the configuration parsing speed up hack. Um, I noticed that service dependencies are 
in 99% of all cases, they are of the type that don't alert for this service if NRP or NSDA or whatever is down. Just don't. If it's anything but OK, the version check for the agent, don't send me a notification. That's exactly what these do. They do exactly that. They, they do nothing else. They have no other impact whatsoever. Uh, you can have service parents. They can be cross-host if you want them to. Uh, if they're on a same host dependency, then you can just write the name of the service description uh, on the same host. So you would write maybe NRP version check, uh, something like that. Uh, hourly value and minimum value. <coughs> These are a bit, a, a bit more weird, you'd say. Uh, the idea here is that you can, you can set a value for a service that reflects how much it's worth for your company every hour. Uh, initially, you would want to set maybe development servers to zero, unless they're also in production or something like that. And then you can use minimum value in your contact definitions to get rid of alerts completely uh, from problems that are not important enough. Uh, the value thing, it gets val the value of a problem, of a notification, is inherited for, through the dependency chain. So if you have a host that goes down, it's worth as much as the host itself and all its services. If you have a network outage, the value of that network outage is the value of the host, all hosts below it, and all the services that are added below there. So it gives you a sort of, okay, this is, re this is a really, really expensive problem. And this is a really, really cheap problem. So then you can fix the expensive problem first. Um, hmm, check source. We discussed, we discussed that earlier. Useful when adding remote checking modules. Uh, there's also like something called make docs, which is the documentation that I just showed you uh, regarding uh, Nagios internals. It's this one. It gets auto-generated using a tool called Doxygen. So if you don't have Doxygen, that command will do absolutely nothing. Uh, you will also need the Nagios sources for this. But I think that uh, Daniel Witzenberg, who is uh, who's the sort of unofficial uh, spec file maintainer, uh, will ship them in uh, RPMs if you if you follow uh, Nagios Devel. We'll get updates. Um, some Easter eggs and micro features. Uh, if you set your object cache file or status file to dev null, they won't get written at all. Earlier, they wouldn't get written at all either because they would get written to dev null, so you wouldn't actually see them. Now, they just, nothing happens at all. Uh, so uh, it's good for those of you who are using something else to get your status data, like live status or endo utils or whatever. Just set it to dev null, and Nagios will only do that one string check and then get back to business. Um, there's a Nagios Devel package available. It was a real pain in the ass, actually, trying to update all the event broker modules that needed updating for Nagios 4, because most of them only needed a recompile. So updating the Nagios, uh, creating a Nagios Devel package that event broker authors can use when they're writing code means that we can actually make good on our agreement that we will only add to stuff. Uh, we, if you move from Nagios 4.0 to Nagios 4.1, you're supposed to have to recompile your modules against the new headers, but then they should work out of the box. When we move from Nagios 3 to Nagios 4, you may have to do some additional work. Uh, but that's a sort of sacred covenant that we have with our with event broker add-on authors. So uh, and now we can actually make good on that without updating all the all the uh, all the event brokers, which is good. <coughs> the add-on status for those of you who use add-ons with Nagios, uh, mod German, mod PNP, and live status and Merlin. Live status you have to get from here for now. I've been talking to Matthias Kettner about getting it merged upstream, but I, uh, he rejected the patch and said that I had to re-add the fields that I, I just removed stuff that are no longer present in Nagios 4. And that made a lot of other stuff break. So I'm going to re-add them and just make them say null, null or something. I don't know. Um, and Merlin is working. So soon you will be able to get live status from, from Matthias Kettner instead. I'm going to be sitting down. I should actually add uh, NDO utils to this list as well because uh, I've been talking to Eric Stanley 
Uh, and we will be doing a sit-down session later today, or possibly tomorrow. I think it's going to be today, uh, where we just fix. We just fix it. It's only a. It shouldn't be more than half an hour tops. So it's pretty quick. <coughs> As usual, there are known bugs. Um, well, there are bugs. Some of them we know about. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Host latency calculation is messed up. If you look at the average host latency, then you will get ridiculous numbers. It could be uh, that it only happens when you do something else or because hosts get scheduled more than once or something like that. I'm not really sure. But host latency calculations are often messed up. Um, if you use aggressive host checks in, uh, in Nagios, on-demand host checks are still run synchronous in serial fashion, synchronously. Well, I'm sure you can read. Um, and environment macros are currently not supported in the workers. I will add that tomorrow. Uh, the reason is that they have to be transferred to the worker and then have to be handled. Uh, it's, it's just not done yet. It's not very difficult. But, uh, and it's also not a very good idea to use environment macros because they uh, take a lot of CPU time to compute. Um, a lot of things have been deprecated as well. Uh, on command line, if you pass the minus O flag, which used to mean don't verify objects, that's removed. It was never listed in help output or anything, and it will now throw an error. It's not really that useful anymore because we resolve the, we verify the objects as we actually parse them. So it doesn't make sense anymore to have that. Uh, if you ask, now you also do not verify your object paths, uh, which used to be very useful to get it to load really huge configurations with a lot of dependencies. Um, it's, you will now get a warning instead, and, uh, and uh, object paths are always verified. It's done in a matter of microseconds now, so don't worry about it. <coughs> More of them. Object configuration in Nagios.cfg is officially unsupported. If you rely on it to work, it will probably stop doing so. I actually didn't even know that, it, that you could have object configuration in Nagios.cfg, and I only found out about it because someone said that it stopped working. Instead of trying to fix it, uh, I just decided to not support it. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, I got a lot of plus ones on the mailing list for that, actually, so that was probably a good idea. Um, embedded Perl has been removed. It was very, very tricky to, to try to support it because we would run into issues with uh, that Perl version doesn't work, and that one has leaks, or that one takes over your uh, read di directory. Uh, it does a lot of magic that we can't really control if we load it into Nagios core directly. So if you, want, uh, if you want to embed a scripting language to make it run really, 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 really fast, you should write, um, uh, you should write a special purpose worker instead and have that connect to Nagios and say, hey, I'll do everything that has this or whatever. Um, I'm not really sure how the filtering there should, should work, but if it's a script engine, we should be able to find Perl or something in the, in the... I'm not really sure about the specifics yet, but that's how you should be doing it. Um, Nagios.cfg, sleep time is gone. We never sleep. We just wait for events to arrive. Um, and if we don't get new events, we just schedule, well, we wait until we're supposed to run the next event for them to arrive, which is basically sleeping. I can show you the, the configuration that I have here is 20 something, well, 25,000 services basically. And how much we're working is this. Oh, you see the main Nagios process there jumping up to about 11% CPU usage every once in a while when it's parsing check results that's coming back. Might go as high as 20. Uh, this, is the, this is the main Nagios process, and these are the workers. You can see it by looking at how much memory it's using. And this is actually bad. I've done something that makes the workers not free all the memory that they're using anymore, so more patches will be coming. But <coughs> you can see the CPU usage is really really gone, doesn't use anything at all anymore. Um, last command check is also, that's not in Nagios CFG, it's one of the 
lives that is output thing. Uh, but command check interval, we don't have that anymore. We just poll for them and they turn up as inbound events, the same as everything else. So we always handle them immediately on arrival. Um, failure prediction, that was never actually implemented in the core. We just had a lot of variables that we carried around and did stuff with. And everything relating to embedded Perl, like P1 file and use embedded Perl implicitly and stuff like that. Uh, Objects, failure prediction again. Um, the second point here is actually this is a this this can be a bit sneaky. Group member exclusions are no longer inherited by group in group in inclusion. So if you used to have group one that had members A and B, and if you had group two, group group one also included group two. Group two excluded B but included C. In Nagios three you would get A and C as the members. In Nagios 4, you will get A, B, and C as the members. Because the implicit, the explicit inclusion here trumps the one, trumps the implicit exclusion from here when we include that group. Is everybody clear on what that means? No. Sort of? Okay, excellent. Ask me later when I'm drunk and I'll explain it splendidly. <laughs> Promise. Um, <coughs> oh, special thanks screen. Um, a lot of people have been, have been very, very instrumental in making Nagios 4 come to life. And uh, I, a couple of weeks ago, actually last weekend, I sent out a sort of competition thing uh, where I said that I would take the top three, uh, top three people that were instrumental to making Nagios Nagios 4 come alive, and I would give them presents. I was pretty drunk when I did it, so, so I, I, I hope OP5 will cover the expenses. I think they will. <laughs> but um, Ethan Galstad, for uh, bringing us all together with this conference and with your amazing invention since 13 years, would you like to please come up here? on uh, voice. I hope you're not trying to suck up to me, Andreas. So I, otherwise, I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get you back tonight. So what? <laughs> Hello, buddy. Oh. This is actually a, this is a whiskey from a Swedish whiskey distillery that ships only very limited edition whiskeys. I've heard it's very, very good, and I've actually tried it, but a long time ago. This is a limited edition bottle, and it might be one of only two in the whole US. Awesome. Lee, maybe? <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, another guy who has been helping me many, many countless hours is Daniel Wittenberg. Uh, he has done extraordinary amounts of testing on very, very expensive equipment that I'm not sure his employers actually knew he was using for that. <laughs> and we had some pretty memorable moments when we managed to get a one terabyte RAM machine uh, crash because it ran out of memory. <laughs> That was fun. So Daniel Wittenberg, would you please step outside? And you get the same because I have no imagination. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other people who need mentioning are people on this uh, on this list here. There are. Probably I've missed a few, but Armin Wolferman and Jörg Linge have both been sending me patches, as has Sven Nierlein. Mark Frost has helped me test a lot of things. I'm not sure if any of, well, I know that most of them aren't here, but if you are, uh, thank you very much. Also Robin Sonnefosch, William Leibson, and everyone who sent me configs for testing that made, that made it really, really sure that nothing breaks in Nagios 4 that used to work. Right, questions? Yep. I can bring the mic over to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, 
is there anything in the new Nerd API that overlaps with what Live Status does now, or do they occupy different roles? No, the uh, Live Status presents you with the the snapshot when you ask for it. You say, "Hey, give me hosts or whatever." Um, then you get the host at that particular moment, whereas the Nerd Radio is supposed to be a subscription channel that you can use for anything that every module can use. So um, for say Mod Gearman, you may want to use uh, you may want to use a channel on the Nagio server that it so that an, when a new worker comes online and says, "Hey, I'm uh, I'm here now," you can have the external command actually push out the plugins and configuration or whatever to the newly connected Mod Gearman server, and then you can do a lot of auto configuration. It's not supposed to do any overlapping with with live status, and the the channels that are built in are actually pretty stupid. Uh, I mean, it's, it's useful to get the host checks and the, the fly around map thingy that I did. It looks cool, but it's actually useless. Um, so it's supposed to be a live feed that stuff can register for. And the, the inbuilt channels will only be the very bare minimum to, to make sure that it continues working, basically. More questions? One from the back there, I think. No? Could you raise your hand again? <coughs> um, hey, is there anything in uh, in Libnagios that's going to make it easier to for a, an event broker module to preempt um, like the normal functioning of, say, a service check or a notification? No, there so is not. So it we're still exiting with. I can't remember the exit constant. The um, yeah, exit three means, yeah, well, you can write event broker modules that override that if you want to, but um, I'd advise against it because a lot of things rely on it. And if you write that as an event broker module, then you're not really sure if you get your callback before something else does or. No, I'm talking about just normal. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an event broker module exit code that you can exit to say interrupt the normal um, you know, uh, DNX does it. Uh, you know, don't, not yeah, just yeah, don't, yeah. don't do this check anymore. I got it. Yeah. Um, no, that nothing has changed in that respect. Okay. You can still say, don't run this check, don't send this notification, don't, don't do that, don't do this. But uh, you can't. Uh, there's nothing in Libnagios doesn't actually help with that. That's core Nagios altogether, where you send the neb callback uh, error override or error override. Uh, that's one. Yeah. Um, so, so nothing has changed in that respect, which is good. Or it would have been pain to port Mon German and DNA. More questions? Not so much of a question. I'm just. I have to say, uh, Andreas, I'm. I'm really impressed. I'm sure everybody else is at. Um, aside from the cryptic algorithm stuff that you threw up on the screen. <laughs> Um, it, the, it impressive, uh, the impressive performance improvements over Nagios Core 3. Um, we have some people, you know, not only here at the conference, but a lot of people with really big environments where uh, this is going to help them immensely. And I love your method of uh, acronym naming with NERD. I know you probably worked hard to <laughs> make an acronym that ended up being NERD. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to give you extra kudos for that. It looks really awesome. So nice work. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions? Oh, well, um, you can look me up between sessions, or I'll be at the bar during the evening event. Um, for online resources, this is my public GitHub mirror thing. Uh, if there are stuff that I port to, Nog to work with Nagios 4, I will put them here. This is where you'll find live status and uh, a lot of other add-ons as well. Um, op5.com for that company presentation that I skipped over because I'm running late already. Uh, so yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>